Have you ever thought about money? Who hasn't, right? How many of us have been so concerned with money? How am I gonna pay my bills? What am I gonna do? Can't make the rent this week? I'm worried. I'm not sure if I'll have to work overtime just to pay the credit card bill or whatever. But that's not what I mean. I mean, have you ever thought about money? Looked at it, examined it? Saw what each bill looks like? What's the Latin motto on each one? I mean, really looked at the money, every centimeter of it, even down to the last penny. The Pharisees and Herodians did. And that's why Jesus uses a common example for them. He says, when they're trying to trap him, show me the money that you use to pay the census tax. And so they do. But each one of us, my brothers and sisters, we think about money and we look at it and we probably know who, who's the image and likeness on each one of those currency. Of course, you know Abraham Lincoln's on the penny, right? You know Benjamin Franklin's on the $100 bill. It's all about the Benjamins. But Jesus uses this example to teach them a greater lesson. See, they're so concerned about money that they use it to trap him, to trap him and say, should you pay the tax? Because the Pharisees said, no. Israelites, the people of God, should be exempt. The Herodians, the soldiers of Herod, who was the Tetrarch, who was the ruler at the time, was the pawn of Caesar, the Romans, right? Who were ruling, protecting the Israelites. So what's it gonna be, Jesus? What's it gonna be? Do you pay the tax? And then the Pharisees arrest you? Say you're going contrary to your heritage? You're not doing what God commanded? Or do you not pay the tax? And then you really get arrested because that's, then the police are gonna come. The soldiers of Herod are right here. So they come to trap Jesus with money. But Jesus teaches them a greater lesson. He says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Each one of us probably is carrying our wallet with the image and likeness of many of our U.S. presidents. Soon they'll transfer the $20 bill to Harriet Tubman, somebody in the American heritage. But my brothers and sisters, when Jesus says, render unto God what is God's, he means you. He means each one of us. Not just in material things rendered to God. Of course, you have to support the church. We see that from the Acts of the Apostles. But literally, we are required to give God our all, to love God with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul. Because we are made in His image and likeness. This is so important. Why? because you either were standing in line just a few moments ago to go to confession, or you had to walk through the line to get to your respective pew, right? So when we render to God what is God's, that means that we're examining our conscience. We're coming to confession when we haven't given God everything, when we have fallen short of the glory of God, because it is hard to be a Christian. It is really difficult to be a Christian, right? You all feel it. It's nothing new from this pulpit to hear that you're persecuted. Maybe you're not put in chains. Maybe you're not lashed 33 times. But you do endure suffering, persecution for calling yourself Catholic, for calling yourself a disciple of Christ, for rendering to God what is God's. Because God is not concerned with money. That has somebody else's image and likeness on it. And if you live in Canada, of course it has the queen on it, right? We have our presidents. All of these different secular 
heroes on our money. God is not concerned with that. God wants you to pay your taxes. God wants you to render to Caesar what is Caesar's, to have, author- have respect for authority. Of course, absolutely. We appreciate all those who are in authority. But we are Christians, and we are called to more, and we are called to render to God in our daily life what is God's. And that means making sacrifices. That means doing things differently. There's nothing that you haven't heard from this pulpit that doesn't call you to conversion because that's what we're called to as Christians. And I have a reading just from the first century, actually the second century. It's called the letter to Diognetus. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing. This is just an excerpt. And this is for Christians in the second century. See if it rings true for you. So the author says, to speak in general terms, we may say that Christians, the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all the cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen in the living world, but their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and wars against it, not because of any injury the soul has done to it, but because of the restriction the soul places on its pleasures. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they have done it any wrong, but because they are imposed to its enjoyments. Does that sound familiar? If it doesn't, come and see me after Mass. We'll go to confession again. Because this is what we're called to, my brothers and sisters. We're called to self-knowledge first. That's the first step, according to St. Teresa of Avila, in the interior life, in your life with Christ. Look at yourself. See what's good, see what's bad, See what's a gift from God, what may be a temptation for you. To examine our conscience, to continually grow in self-knowledge, and then go to confession so that we might be the soul of this world, so that we might be that salt that hasn't lost its taste, the light that is underneath a bushel basket. We want to go out into this world and proclaim Christ and Christ crucified, but it is hard. It is difficult in this anti-Christian world. Some would say maybe it's a post-Christian world. Even more so, we need to speak the words of life, speak the words of truth, because we are called to more. So just like that money that has the image and likeness of presidents, of queens and kings and rulers and even people who had an influence on culture, you too have an indelible mark on your soul that was put there at baptism that calls you to holiness, to call you to remain in sanctifying grace, to make acts of virtue so that that actual grace will continue to flow in your heart and your soul. We are called to so much more, so much more than looking at money, power, respect, because all of us, I'm sure, have tried to make our work, our family, our lives, lives in our image and likeness. Because I'm right. If you guys would only listen to me, then you'd have everything. If you would only do everything right, then God will give you millions of dollars. All your cares would go away. You will have no tribulation if you just follow what we say and do what I tell you. That's a lie, right? Because our Lord and Savior said, you're gonna have tribulation in this world. But rejoice because I have overcome the world. 
We are not called to this world. We are not called to money. We are not called to houses and cars and all the great things that material wealth can bring to us. Because you know what? And I've said it before. I'll say it again and again and again. I've been to a bunch of funerals and no Hearst has a trailer hitch so that the guy can bring what he wants to heaven with him or his wife bring what she wants to heaven with her. You will be in a box six feet under meeting your maker. That's the reality. And we will be judged on love, judged on how much we rendered to God what is God's and put away what Caesar has given us because it fades. Point blank, it fades. Money goes away, just a bunch of ones and zeros in your bank account, you can't take that to heaven. It's nice while we're here on earth and you use it, you use it, and I use that verb very specifically because it's useful. But at the same time, what is most important is your growth in holiness. You're rendering to God what is God's. And today is the feast of St. John Paul II, a saint that you can Google, you can YouTube. Some of you may even have met him, saw him. I have. I saw a saint walking around, living, breathing, smiling, jumping up and down, dancing at World Youth Day. This is the joy of the gospel. This is what we're called to, be saints to embrace God's love and mercy and rejoice in knowing our faults and failures because it only draws me closer to God because I see how much unlike God I am. It is so important, my brothers and sisters, so, so important to learn this lesson. It's a journey, of course, and St. Paul reminds us, of, reminds us of this in our second reading. What does he say about the virtues? He says to the church of Thessalonica, he says, we remember you always in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith, labor of love, and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love. The work of faith takes work. The labor of love. Remember, God doesn't call workers into the vineyard. He calls laborers. The labor of love. And then most especially in this world, the endurance of hope. I have to endure, keeping my eyes not focused on this world, but on heaven. I hope, I work in faith, I labor in love, I endure in the hope that Jesus Christ has overcome this world. This is the gospel, this is our life, this is what we are called to. This will transform the world. And we have the privilege, we're not worthy, but we have the privilege to say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, that you should come underneath my roof that you should enter into my heart, my soul. Ravish me with your love, your mercy. Wash away my sins. Lord, I'm not worthy of any of this. I'm not even worthy to be called your son or daughter. That's why we put it in the mural. I'm not worthy. But yet say the word and my soul will be healed. Oh man, that word healing peace. They're so nice. So different from squishy, which makes you feel uncomfortable. Peace, healing. That's what we're called to. Joy, love, mercy, faith. St. John Paul II exemplified this and even expounded upon it. His writings are prolific. Are you in suffering? He wrote a document on that. Are you a priest? Wrote a document on that. Are you a layperson? Ah, document on that. How about a seminarian? Oh, document on that. How to form these unformable guys? Document on that. The dignity of women. Check. 
the guardian of the Redeemer, St. Joseph, check. And best of all, and what gives me chills, he spoke about Mary all the time. We've said it before, my brothers and sisters, there's no excuse. God has provided the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, and he has given us the magisterium to guide us on that highway to heaven. In this journey of faith, the endurance of hope, your labor of love, God has given us the means. It's Googleable. Let's take it, own it. Paragraph by paragraph, sentence by second, sentence, moment by moment, hour by hour. It's a choice, it's an endurance, it's a labor. It is the work of faith. That should give us hope that we're not alone on that journey. That we have help to render to God what is God's. Let us embrace that. But most especially today at this Mass, let us embrace the Savior who gave his life so that we might have eternal life. He gave us his body, blood, soul, and divinity so that we would not feel orphans. We would not feel downcast. We would not embrace the sorrow of this world, but rejoice in the hope of the gospel, the joy of the gospel, and the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord now and forever. Amen.